Kia ora koutou and good morning everyone. A light bulb works when it's connected to electricity. Without electricity, all you have is a glass globe and darkness. A river works when water flows through a channel along the ground. Without water, there is no river, just a scar on the landscape. Your mouth and your tongue speak when your mind provides a thought. Without a mind, the mouth and the tongue have nothing to say. During the month of August, we're focusing on four messages from the Book of Acts in support of Arotahi, the New Zealand Baptist Missionary Society. Then at the end of August, we'll take up a special Renew Together offering for our Baptist missionaries. The Book of Acts tells how the Holy Spirit used ordinary men and women to share the message about Jesus. The Spirit is essential to the spread of the gospel. The Spirit is to mission what electricity is to, to a light bulb. The Spirit is to mission what water is to a river. The Spirit is to mission what the mind is to speech. The church simply cannot function without the Spirit of Jesus. Last week, we heard how the Holy Spirit worked through Peter and the other apostles in Acts chapter 2. This week, we hear how the Holy Spirit worked through Stephen. From Acts chapter 6, verse 8, we pick up the story of the Spirit and Stephen. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. May the Spirit of Jesus illuminate God's word for us. Some things are powerful, but not graceful. Storms are like that. Lots of power, but little or no grace. Storms can do a lot of damage. Guns are also powerful, but once the trigger has been pulled, there's no grace. The bullet is unforgiving. Other things are graceful, but not powerful. Take butterflies, for example. Butterflies are graceful. They're beautiful to watch, but they lack power. You have nothing to fear from a butterfly. Flowers are also graceful, but not powerful. At least not in the same way that storms and guns are powerful. In fact, flowers are quite fragile. Sometimes flowers can have a powerful effect, though, if arranged in a certain way or given with great love. Then there are those things which are both powerful and graceful. Medicine is powerful and graceful on a chemical level. It has the power to heal you in a relatively gentle way. Dancers possess both power and grace. They have exceptional strength for their body, body weight. At the same time, their movement is beautiful to look at. A ballerina glides with a grace and power that defies gravity and touches the heart. And then there is the power and grace of the moon. The moon is beautiful to look at, reflected light gracing the night sky, but with the power to move whole oceans. The Holy Spirit combines divine grace with divine power. The Holy Spirit possesses a power unmatched in the universe and a grace far beyond human comprehension. The Holy Spirit gives life to all creation. 
In verse 8, we read that Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power. This is another way of saying that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. If Stephen was the light bulb, then the Holy Spirit provided the electricity. If Stephen was the channel, the Holy Spirit was like water flowing through him. If Stephen was the mouthpiece, then the Holy Spirit was the mind providing the thought for Stephen to speak. The grace and power of the Spirit of God enabled Stephen to perform great wonders and signs among the people. We're not told exactly what these signs and wonders were, but it may have included miraculous healings. To heal someone is an action that is both gracious and powerful. Verse 9 says opposition arose from one of the Jewish synagogues. A synagogue was a bit like a local church congregation, except for people of the Jewish faith. These Jews began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him. Here we see the God-given power and grace of reason and logic. The Holy Spirit empowered Stephen to overcome his opponents with words of reason as opposed to acts of violence. Christian faith has intellectual integrity. Becoming a Christian does not mean throwing away critical thinking. Although we cannot grasp all the mysteries of Christian faith, we still seek to understand what we can. Jesus taught us to love God with our mind, as well as our heart and everything else we possess. Stephen's spirit-inspired rationale and wisdom should have been enough to convince the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. But they refused to believe. Worse than that, they framed Stephen. They falsely accused Stephen of blasphemy. They stirred up the anger of the people and brought Stephen before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the name for the ruling council of Jewish leaders. Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin, falsely accused of blasphemy, just a few years before Stephen. Stephen was quite literally following in the footsteps of Christ. The accusers said, to, said Stephen spoke against the holy place, that is the Jerusalem temple, saying Jesus will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down. Jesus had predicted with tears that the temple would be destroyed. This happened in AD 70, nearly 40 years after Jesus. But it wasn't Jesus who destroyed Jerusalem. The Romans destroyed the holy city because the Jews rebelled against Rome. Jesus tried to warn the people, telling them not to revolt against Rome. But the people would not listen. As for the charge that Jesus had come to change the customs Moses handed down, this wasn't right either. In fact, Jesus came to fulfill the law of Moses. Stephen could see that Jesus' once-for-all sacrifice on the cross made the ceremonial and ritual aspects of the Jewish law unnecessary. The moral aspects of the law, which can be summarized as loving God and loving your neighbor, still stand. But we don't need to keep sacrificing animals for the atonement of sin because Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is sufficient. Our forgiveness is through faith in what Jesus has done for us. We can see why the Jewish religious authorities felt so threatened. If they accepted what Stephen was saying, their whole organization would need to be restructured. They would lose a lot of power and control and status. What's more, they would have to humble themselves and admit they were wrong about Jesus. No wonder they wanted to silence Stephen. Verse 15 says, All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Angels have knowledge from heaven. Stephen had knowledge from heaven, and the Sanhedrin could plainly see that. It was written all over Stephen's face. Yet they would not concede that Stephen was right about Jesus. As far as the Sanhedrin were concerned, this was a legal proceeding. Stephen was on trial, so the high priest gave Stephen an opportunity to respond to the charges brought against him. 
Stephen addresses his accusers with grace and respect, calling them brothers and fathers. Stephen starts by finding common ground with his enemies. He talks about their shared history, their whakapapa or ancestry. After highlighting God's call of Abraham, Stephen goes on to feature Joseph and Moses. The thing Joseph and Moses have in common is they were both used by God to save the people, and they were both rejected by the people they came to save. Stephen is drawing a connection here with Jesus. Like Joseph and Moses, Jesus was rejected by the people he came to save. In verses 37 to 39 of Acts 7, Stephen says, This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. Stephen is saying that Jesus is the prophet Moses talked about, and they, the Jewish leadership, have rejected Jesus, just like they, their ancestors rejected Moses. Stephen goes on to talk about the idolatry of the Israelites in the wilderness, and how later when they settled in Canaan, the first Jewish temple came to be built. But the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. Heaven is God's throne, and the earth is his footstool. It's like the Jewish religious leaders have ironically made an idol out of the temple. They are worshipping something made by human hands. They have made the temple and sacrificial system more important than God Almighty. From verse 51, Stephen makes his point clear, saying, You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, that is Jesus. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. This is powerful stuff from Stephen. Stephen is borrowing words from Moses. In Deuteronomy 10, Moses had said to the Israelites in the wilderness, Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Circumcision was the sign of God's covenant with Abraham. In ancient Israel, you were not considered part of the people of God if you were not circumcised. You don't need to be circumcised to become a Christian. Baptism and communion are the signs of the new covenant for Christians. Whether it is circumcision or baptism, though, outward rituals mean nothing without a corresponding inward loyalty of the heart and mind. Circumcision of the heart refers to keeping the covenant with God in the core of your being. Stephen was saying that many of the Israelites of his time were like the Israelites of Moses' time, not truly committed to God and his covenant. The Sanhedrin thought they were putting Stephen on trial, but Stephen, by the grace and power of God's spirit, demonstrates that it is the religious leaders themselves who are on trial before God. They are the guilty ones, not him. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. In Acts 2, when Peter confronted the crowd with the fact they had crucified the Messiah of God, the people were cut to the heart and repented. But Stephen is facing a different audience. These are not the same God-fearing Jews of Acts 2. Stephen's audience are more like corrupt politicians. These are men who, are on who only know the power of brute force and coercion by fear, theirs is a power without grace. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven 
and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The power Stephen knows is different from political power. Stephen's power is the power of the Spirit, power woven together with grace. Stephen, the man with a face like an angel, sees heaven open and Jesus, the Son of Man, standing at the right hand of God. Stephen is witnessing to the fact that God has vindicated Jesus by raising him from the dead and giving him the place of highest honour in heaven. From verse 57 we continue. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. At this point, all justice has broken down. This is not a lawful proceeding. This is a lynching. The crowd is out of control. They are about to murder Stephen. Stephen has clearly hit a raw nerve. On some level, the crowd know that Stephen is right, but they don't want to admit they are wrong. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen responds just like Jesus, with the power and grace of forgiveness. Verse 60 says that Stephen fell asleep. Actually, he died but for those who die believing in Jesus, death is like a restful sleep. Death is not something to fear if we are forgiven in Christ and forgiving of others. For just as Jesus was raised from the dead to eternal life, so too those who hope in Jesus will be raised. In verse 1 of Acts chapter 8, we read how on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. While persecution is not pleasant, we can see God's power and grace at work in it. It's not that God wanted the followers of Jesus to be harmed, but like Joseph who was sold into slavery by his brothers, God used it for good. As Christian believers fled for their lives, they took the message about Jesus with them. And so the Christian faith spread like seeds on the wind. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. When we hear the word martyr, we think of someone who was killed for their beliefs. And while that is true, the word martyr originally meant witness. A martyr is a witness. Stephen bore witness to the power and grace of Jesus and died as a consequence. As Christians... We don't want to be persecuted for our faith. We pray that God delivers us from trial and persecution. But if we do suffer because of our allegiance to Christ, at least we know our witness is being taken seriously. Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Sharing our faith with others is a brave thing to do. It makes us vulnerable. But that is the pattern Jesus set. No one was more vulnerable than Christ on the cross. Sometimes our witness for Jesus is well received, like when Peter spoke to the crowds at Pentecost and 3,000 responded in faith to his message. Other times, though, our witness for Jesus is misunderstood, or it is understood all too well, and we are rejected, like Stephen. Peter's message in Acts 2 was in the Goldilocks zone, but tradition says Peter was eventually crucified, upside down, for his testimony about Jesus. We are not likely to be killed for our witness like Stephen or Peter. But the reality remains 
Sometimes we make ourselves a target when we speak the truth about Jesus and align ourselves with him. The promise of scripture is that those who share in Christ's sufferings will also share in his glory. May the Spirit of God fill us with the power and grace to stand for Jesus. Amen.